Welcome to TFR Let's Talk. I'm your host, Swapnil Bhartia, and my next guest is Matt Golden, founder and CEO of Recurve. Matt, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, likewise. Thank you for having me. And we are going to talk about energy sector and, of course, open source and LF energy. When we look at energy sector, all we see is power lines. That's all we, we do know. Yeah, there are grids and all those things, especially what happened in Texas. And we, you know, so, but a, a lot of things are uh, changing, especially the way we are consuming and actually we are becoming producers of electricity as well. You know, we have those Tesla, you know, power. I mean, you. I don't want to name any company, but the whole chemistry is changing, the way we are consuming is changing. So what I want to understand from you, since you have been in the industry for so long, how have you seen the whole evolution of energy sector? Well, I was I, I did start in this industry before solar was a thing. So I, I remember clearly that uh, 12 Newman in the summer was our peak in California, not that very long ago. So as we trend towards decarbonization of the power grid uh, here in the US, I think the stat right now is 71% of all US uh, power consumers are buying energy from a utility that has a GHG goal. And I actually saw Oregon adopted a new goal yesterday. So that number may have actually gone up. Uh, so this is not a left coast, right coast, politically leaning type of a policy objective. This is pretty much across the board. And uh, as renewables and particularly solar accelerates, this is creating really expensive load shapes for the grid. And as you said at the beginning, um, when people think of the grid, they think of power lines and transformers and transmission systems and stuff they can see. Um, you were really focused on the behind the meter availability of resources and part of the grid, you know, if you were to really distill the grid down, it's pretty straightforward. We need to supply enough electrons at the right times and the right locations on the grid to meet demand so that everyone's lights and air conditioners and refrigerators have enough energy to run. So there's an equivalency. Uh, you can generate more energy, you can store it, you can move it, uh, but you can also change the way energy is consumed. Uh, and they're exactly equivalent, actually. Um, and in many ways, it's much more valuable to reach behind the meter and affect demand. Um, the absence of needing energy is lower cost, um, but also provides benefits to customers um, and is often much more quickly rolled out. What I also want to understand is that uh, how is energy sector embracing this software driven, AI driven word so that uh, whether you talk about substations, whether you talk about, you know, great systems that are smarter, that are not just, you know, putting the switch up and down. So can you talk about the smart factor that is uh, kind of getting, uh, uh, like making inroads in the energy sector? Yeah, I mean, I think when you talk about grid intelligence and using data to make smarter grid decisions, uh, fundamentally, historically, we're very focused on central command and control. You know, a utility, a network operating, everyone can kind of visualize somebody setting in a bunch of big screens, making decisions for everybody about what power supply uh, is going to be direct, you know, acquired on the grid and how to meet demand. But um, the world that we're focused on is much more distributed. And we think the entire grid is trending much more towards distributed resources. Uh, this is your EV in your garage, your power wall or batteries, uh, but also your air conditioner or heat pump and the controls it's attached to and the insulation in your attic that affects how much energy it uses. Uh, they're fundamentally bespoke um, and they're non-centralized. And so telemetry becomes much more challenging. So we're focusing on helping utilities, but also enabling the market to measure, quantify, and be able to integrate these distributed resources in a consistent way. Um, and that's not a function of trying to centralize it and figure out the algorithm or the machine learning something or other that's going to solve everybody's problems. It's really about not only a distributed grid, but distributed intelligence. So, you know, we're focused on helping utilities identify where their demand is coming from, uh, forecast it, uh, but also translate that into a price signal so that the innovative companies out there, and there are tens of thousands of companies inventing the types of business models and technologies we need to make demand responsive to the grid. Um, but rather than needing to control each and every widget, you know, everybody's smart toaster ovens, uh, this is about figuring out what that value is to the grid. And that's really what we're focused on is that intersection of the grid and buildings. And so we're looking at interval data, particularly coming from utility meters and using that to measure the effect that is happening on demand from behind those meters so that it can be forecasted and again, enabling the market to figure out what to do about it. Uh, because solving the problem behind those meters is not a function of what's best for the utility. It's actually 
how to translate what's best for the utility into a business model and a value proposition customers are actually going to say yes to um, and be willing to participate in. And that's a much more complicated equation. Um, and we think there aren't going to be single winners. Uh, in fact, we take a we, we work really hard to be agnostic. Uh, we think there's going to be lots of flowers blooming. Right. Uh, and then we are talking about, as we were talking about earlier also, as uh, the kind of, uh, because of all those uh, power cells and electric cars that, you know, we are kind of creating also energy. How is that changing? Because other, traditionally, uh, it just, electrons just flow, you know, towards the houses. Now people are storing, you know, their own energy in their own batteries. So what kind of uh, load it's creating for the grids? And how, and as more and more people uh, install solar and these batteries, uh, how do you see that is going to affect the whole energy sector in itself? Or, or you say, hey, I don't think there's going to be any impact whatsoever if everybody becomes a producer. Well, it's enormous impacts. Um, you know, the state of California, our, we have our duck curve. And if you're not in energy, it's a, it's a rather famous shape that's emerging in our grid, which is... Uh, on a, on a hot day when the sun's out, and we don't have a lot of air conditioning in particular, uh, there's a substantial period in the middle of the day where we have more solar than we literally know what to do with. Uh, we are paying other states to take it from us. Uh, we're curtailing grid scale renewables, meaning people have power, they have, we have large scale solar that we are turning off during those periods. Uh, so the entire game is about balancing supply and demand. And you can do that lots of ways. Storage is really critical, You know, putting the, that, those electrons into a battery to use later. Very important. A lot of those batteries, though, are not personal property, living behind people's meters in their garage and have multiple purposes. You know, not just they're not just grid sta stability, but they're also to help with power outages and resiliency. Um, so, our approach, because it is so incredibly complicated, is is to focus again on all of those resources behind the meter, whether that's solar producing energy or the battery storing it, or the fact that when it comes time to stabilize the grid and discharge that battery the efficiency of your air conditioner and how much of that energy is being used on site determines how much of it returns to the grid. Um, and so, you know, the value engineering exercise for how to optimize the control of all of these distributed systems built by all these different manufacturers that have different use cases for different parties, um, we don't think is something that a utility is going to solve for or is going to come from a fancy piece of software. Um, you know, so our, our approach is, again, to be relatively agnostic to the solutions uh, and focus on what was the outcome um, and what is that worth? And it's creating cash flows, because we think fundamentally um, markets move based on what makes money. So, you know, feeding back and producing electrons that you can return to the grid during periods of peaking power demand. You know, when there's when we have blackouts, Texas, of course, was a wake up call. But in California, these black and brown outs over the summer in particular are endemic and getting significantly worse every year. So, you know, feed, pr producing excess electrons, whether they're produced, stored and discharged or decreasing demand on those periods, frankly, all of it has equivalent value. And so being able to send that signal so that, frankly, customers get a better deal, the market makes more money and the grid gets a valuable resource that can help decarbonize and uh, actually keep those economics spinning um, so that utilities can actually make money during those periods. Um, and we think it's that that price signal will ultimately determine uh, the mix of business model and technologies and how they operate together to maximize those benefits. Um, but there isn't there's it's the opposite of a one size fits all solution. Um, there, it's it's really about embracing the complexity. Right. I also want to talk about something which may be totally off topic, but uh, as we have seen uh, in terms of CDNs, right, with the video content where, you know, they establish CDN content delivery networks and Netflix and all those, they set up, you know, small data centers near me. So so in 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 the context of energy, the grids they store also, uh, when we look at uh, states like California, and there are a lot of other places also where it can become challenging. Uh, what kind of innovative uh, approaches that uh, the sector is taking to to bring the same concept to the energy sector as well? So that I mean, we should not have to worry about energy in 2021. You know, blackouts that reminds me of no offenses of Indian villages where you know you don't have power. But so so what are we doing? You know, what kind of approaches, new approaches we are adopting? Because things are going to get worse. Actually, the more we are consuming electricity. Traditional approaches, the command and control central hub and spoke model has fallen apart. It's not delivering. Um, so we're seeing 
the very beginnings of a massive influx and scaling of these distributed energy resources of solar and storage, right? There are pretty much, we're past the point of installing solar without storage in places like California. Um, but the system has been fairly broken, um, you know, particularly in the US, but across the world, historically, most utilities have been monopolies. You know, so I think we're, we're moving towards less, the more deregulated markets with more competition. Um, and we're moving away from a time where, of central planning and central solutions. Um, it's far too expensive. It's far too bespoke. Um, and I think we're right at the beginning of, of a, many of these models emerging. I mean, we, we see regularly business models that are really on a daily basis. We're identifying companies with new cool tech that's trying to reach the market. So the real innovation we're seeing is in demand response, the work that my company is doing, and frankly, why we use open source. Um, we subscribe to open source as a good development philosophy in general and think there's some significant advantages to, you know, sharing the load and being transparent. But the fundamental reason we open source is that we're measuring and quantifying and forecasting. And for everyone to be able to agree to those numbers, to understand how and be confident in these forecasts, but also be able to transact upon them because uh, there's money changing hands based on the, what we're measuring. What we're measuring is a function of the baseline that we're forecasting. And it's that baseline calculations, how we forecast what an energy, what the energy use in a building is going to be, which is the basis for projecting demand and need, but also for measuring the results. Um, you can think of that as a weights and measures, right? That's the, that's the agreement on what a kilowatt hour is or a bushel of corn for flexibility, um, which is not obvious that when you change a building, there's nothing to measure against anymore. So how do you know what happened? And that's the fundamental problem we're solving because we're now trading in that what happened. <laughs> that becomes a commodity. Um, and so the reason we have always been open source and that we are one of the original LFE, Linux Foundation Energy members, is that um, in order to create the confidence and to frankly avoid litigation when it comes to trading on a calculated value, and value is actually being exchanged, everybody needs to be confident in it. You need to be able to verify it. There can't be a black box. And that's right at the core uh, of our approach and why why we're open source, really all of our core methods and code are open sourced. And the innovation that gets built on top of that is the ability to be agnostic to the solution and say, actually, I don't know if it's your battery or your thermostat or some combo of the two or whatever it is you're bringing to the table that a customer is willing to buy, right? Um, we're going to ignore all of that. We don't care if it's solar storage or EVs or insulation. What we're going to focus on is the measurable effect at the meter to the grid and pay for that and then allow the market to emerge and compete with the right price signal. And I think that's the biggest barrier is that these innovative solutions don't have a path to market. And if we can create that opportunity and we can align the incentives so that whether it's Google with Nest or Ecobee or United Technologies or any other company in this space, um, their profit motive is aligned with our grid needs. And from that, I think we'll see you know the real upscale in, uh, that we need to get the level of resource on the grid to keep it in balance as we decarbonize. Um, but remember, the big, the big change that's happening is we've gone from a nice, consistent, baseload, stable grid built on fossil fuels. Um, and the, the reason the, all of this, these challenges are stemming from the fact that we're moving really quickly away from that towards a clean energy grid, uh, towards more intermittent resources, um, which presents real challenges. And real opportunity, but we shouldn't minimize the challenge. If you look at energy sector, I think you folks are still relatively new to to to, to open source. Uh, I see a parallel with the telecom industry, where they uh, they used to have all black boxes, they used to have all proprietary technology, but they are moving towards it, and they are collaborating. So uh, you are one of the founding members of LF Energy. Um, when was it then you you kind of decided that, hey, you know what, open source is is the way to move forward. Because it's, you know, op the, the thing with open source is that you cannot go far too much alone. You know, you do need player. And that's why, you know, you uh, we lean on each other. We uh, leverage uh, technologies developed by each other companies. So can you talk about when you decide, hey, you know what, let's go open source. Let's, uh, you know, create the LF Energy. Yeah, so... Open source has been in our DNA actually preceding Linux Foundation. Um, you know, one of our core disrupting ideas was that 
if we're going to all measure and bet on a derived value, a calculation that can't be a black box, right? That uh, there was a point in the U.S. for real that every state had a different definition of a bushel of corn. And that meant you couldn't trade across state boundaries, which is actually why weights and measures is in the U.S. Constitution as a power of Congress. Um, and it's a key regulatory function. So, you know, really preceding Linux Foundation, we, we from the very beginning, we've looked at open source and being in total transparency, what we call a revenue grade calculation. It's predefined methods, predefined code, the ability to verify that all of the rules are followed correctly um, is really essential. And so um, we've been open sourcing it, but open sourcing it on our own. We didn't have a community around it. And at the end of the day, as CEO of Recurve, you know, I had ultimate authority to make changes. It was rather unilateral. Didn't do that. <laughs> but um, there was potential was always there because it was really just we were open sourcing the code, but it was really our code. And so um, we saw Linux Foundation as an opportunity to really mature that. You know, we are, I would say, experts in our own way in open source, but we hadn't built big open source communities before and wanted to be part of something bigger, um, but also wanted to have real governance um, because I did look at that as a problem, right? Like, in fact, I saw it more of a problem than most of our customers or others that like, I knew I had unilateral control if I was to exercise it and that wasn't healthy. Uh, so we looked at uh, Linux Foundation as a really valuable place to bring our co bring our project that was, and now projects that we've been working on um, and take it out from under our wing, and put it into an actual governed public process um, and make it part of a larger set of solutions. Because we're, we're very careful, we're not, we're not solving all the world's problems. We have a very a rather niche corner case that we're focused on that is incredibly complicated. And that's the other advantage um, of open source in a community, which is it's everything we can do to solve this little corner case. It's actually the energy industry is enormous. It's, an, it's the biggest industry. So uh, while, while the, the, the problems we're tackling look like a little corner case, uh, they represent a massive body of work. And so that's one of the other challenges is that no one's going to develop the open source project that solves all the energy industry's project problems. Um, in fact, from a software development standpoint, it's like the you, know, you can't build software that way. In fact, you go the other way and say, "What's the narrowest problem I can solve and build from there?" Um, so we have very, you know, a very deep ambitions and a very specific set of use cases, and need to connect up and collaborate with others um, in other areas. Since you have been involved with the LFE uh, from the very beginning, how have you seen the evolution of this uh, foundation within Linux Foundation? What have you folks achieved in all these years? I mean, we've seen a massive uptick in adoption. Um, what started out as very bespoke California-centric methods and code um, are now being used across the US, Australia, uh, touching EU, Canada, um, we're no longer the only ones implementing it, which is uh, from a software company standpoint, like sort of terrifying and awesome at the same time. Um, but that's always to plan. That was the goal. Um, and we're still striving to build a real community. One of the challenges in our space, in the energy industry is uh, it's been very kind of engineering focused over the years. And so there aren't actually a lot of companies that look like real software companies. Um, it's been, you know, we, we deal in data analytics and data processing. Um, so it's been interesting, you know, as the industry matures, it frankly requires a new set of skills. Um, the type of data work we're doing now when we're looking at millions and millions of interval meters, that's not stuff you can do on local servers. That's not stuff you can do with R code, right? That's not stuff that you can do in a notebook. You know, it requires really sophisticated software and massive parallelization. Um, and so I think the industry is sort of retooling around that there. And frankly, there's a bunch of the incumbency that doesn't have those skill sets, um, which is challenging. Um, I would say, again, this is not an industry that is really populated by many real software companies. Um, and so to that degree, it's actually been challenging to find real collaborators as well. Um, lots of folks that can, again, write amazing Excel spreadsheets. And I've seen some Excel spreadsheets that would blow your mind, um, put things in our run things through Stata or other data processing, you know, analytics, data science tools. Um, but that just doesn't cut it anymore. You know, we're talking about thousands and thousands of servers hours to process this kind of data. It's just nothing that can be done locally anymore. You said, you know, that uh, the, I mean, open source is in the DNA of the company. What happens with open source when you're, as you're alluding to earlier that, you know, it was your code as a CEO, you can you know, call the shots, but you contributed that code 
to a neutral body, you kind of gave away control over your technology and given it to a, a foundation. Uh, a lot of companies are embracing open source, but we keep hearing these questions again and again. Uh, how do you kind of, you know, still uh, build a business around open source? Because sometimes people confuse open source as a business model, which is not the case. These are two different things. Since you have done it, so I want to hear from you, what is your take on it? So the concern being that you don't control your own code, you're sharing your code with your potential competitors. Um, so one is it's a meritocracy. So to the degree that we continue to be the ones doing most of the development on the code, um, we continue to you know, play a very strong role in the future of that software. Um, it is really open source. If it goes in a direction we don't like, we always reserve the right to fork it and take it the direction we think it needs to go, um, which could happen. We don't want that to happen, but it could happen. Um, we also have something relatively unique, which is our code is not just software. It's actually tied directly to methods that were developed through, I would say, a quasi standard setting process, that, but we really adhere to those consensus rules of standard setting. So our software is actually an instantiation of a set of methods that have been developed in a consensus process. And so that code to be valid has to be tied to change. If we're gonna change something in the code, if it's not a bug fix or some feature enhancement, um, if we wanna change any of the underlying methods or make it fundamentally work differently, we have to go back to that methods process and negotiate it um, with stakeholders. Um, and again, in our business model, that's part of the disruption we're bringing to the market is we're breaking open the black box of the past where you know, consultants prided themselves and bespoke you know, unique solutions. Uh, and we think standardization is the problem. You know, being more accurate, but not having anybody able to understand how you got there or reproduce your results is not the solution. It's not, that doesn't, this problem is not an accuracy problem. The problem is you can't forecast or predict what the outcome is gonna be. And you got multiple parties getting paid based on that number and someone's gonna get paid more and someone's gonna get less, big paid less depending on what it says. Um, so, you know, we built our business. We also are careful what we open source. Um, you know, we think there are aspects that are critical, like again, the code that enables us to clean the data and create a baseline like can't be ours, right? We, if we own that, it's broken. But our real business, and this is the difference between the open source code base engines that we create that take you know, data in in a given format and process it in a certain way and generate these regression models and all things that we actually do in our open source engines. Um, but turning that into something that scales um, that's where it branches into business model. So how we take that code that lives in the Linux Foundation and implement it in a way that can be automated and parallelized and is secure and private and has all the functions and fe features and tools that our customers need, that's our business model. And that's not open source. Um, but others could do it too. They just have to compete in those dimensions. As the energy sector is becoming more and more software dependent or like a, just the way we saw some cases of ransom attack on gas pipeline, are you worried about as more and more, you know, our infrastructure is becoming software dependent uh, that we might be exposed to those things? Now there's an executive order also from the Biden administration, which is more about bill of materials. So you do know it is more like, like focusing more on open source. So we should know what is there. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, cyber, Attacks and security are critical. Um, security is challenging. It's not, you know, use a name in the news, but it's not about it's not about McAfee on your local computer. It's it's uh, much more involved than that, and it's much more of a process. And frankly, again, it has to be built into your DNA. Uh, it's not as simple. So, I mean, I think there's real advantages to distributing intelligence from the standpoint. I mean, we don't we we for example. Uh, never commingle anything. Every single customer we have lives on a totally discrete node on our platform. There's no multi-tenancy anywhere in our system, uh, very much for those reasons. Uh, we're actually in the final stages as a company getting SOC 2 certified as well, which we think was a useful process um, because it's very hard. It, security is much more of a gray area than it's given credit. And from a retail understanding where security is something you install in your machine, you know, security is a thousand things you do every single day. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a real issue and, you know, open, again, the combination of distributing, not centralizing minimizes that risk or just decreases that risk. And, 
you know, open source has some significant advantages. You know, we think the more people that look at code, the better it gets, the more secure it gets. Um, there are some counterfacts to that as, from a, as well, potentially, but, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a huge challenge across the board. But the main thing being that if someone were to hack into one of our nodes, they would, it would give them very limited impact relative to a gas pipeline that feeds the entire East Coast, things along those lines. And so distributed infrastructure, it, there are definite risks, especially as you get into like IoT and whatnot that we have to surmount. Um, but it also distributes and limits to some degree the impact. Matt, thank you so much for taking time out today and, and talk about not only the company, uh, your whole open source story, which kind of predates LFE, but also talk about the challenges in the energy sector, which we most of us don't even think about it. All we see is power lines and transformer. So thanks for sharing those invites, uh, insights and also sharing how uh, you folks are collaborating uh, around energy sector. So thanks for those uh, thoughts and I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Great, thank you very much.